This is Invest Talk. Independent thinking, shared success. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Wednesday, September 14th, 2022 edition. I'm Justin Klein, and I'm excited for this hour with you and connecting with your thoughts, your concerns, and your goals. And I do this by really getting to the way of thinking that you need to have to tackle all of your different finance and investment questions. And my phone number is always the same, 888-99-CHART, 888-992-4278. I've got a packed podcast for you today. Our main focus point is really just going to be on today's uh, economic data that came in and the fact that stock stabilized after uh, everyone kind of throwing a conniption fit yesterday uh, on the big market sell-off. And really, it was uh, just a... It was just a, a, a return to where we were early last week, uh, kind of a round trip, just showing that the market was a bit off sides, that the Fed was going to maybe pivot. And we're going to discuss that, discuss all of the things that the market is thinking about when it comes to inflation, uh, fisc- fiscal and monetary policy, and uh, what we should expect for the balance of the year. So that's uh, what I'm going to mainly tackle. Also, I want to touch on the loan, the junk loan market. Uh, there's been a lot of chasing of yield and yield that can um, pay dividends if you do it correctly, uh, but it can also mean some pain and certain companies are feeling the pain of these higher rates and we're going to look at that. Also, when does it pay or does it pay to have a mortgage in retirement? In a rising rate environment, uh, the calculations uh, typically do change. So we're going to look at that. And then lastly, I want to highlight a warning by the SEC to Chinese companies. I think it's uh, definitely something to take note as many of your indices you hold, as well as uh, maybe individual stocks are tied to Chinese equities listed here on U.S. exchanges. So those are things that are on the docket for me, but ultimately I want to know what is on your mind. That is most important. And we have many voice bank questions ready to play as well. And so I've, uh, I've all this planned out for this episode of Invest Talk. And of course, taking your cl- your live calls as well is certainly most important. 888 chart 888 Now let's take a look at the market today. The S&P was up about 13 points, modest up day after the little bit of a bounce from the sell-off yesterday. And you had some uh, notable moves, mainly in the steel uh, and basic materials industry. You had Nucor announce earnings, and they were much lighter uh, than expected. And or the sold off accordingly, down about 16% today. And now analysts are expecting uh, profits to go from $30 per share all the way down to $13 per share. It shows you how cyclical and volatile the the market is uh, or the, the uh, sec- that sector is, the commodities, especially steel, something that's very commoditized. And that was uh, really a driver of uh, some of the sell-off today. Uh, but if you look at the the broad sectors as a whole, or the, the I guess the the style boxes, large cap growth definitely had a nice little bounce. What was interesting about the bond market both yesterday and today was that short term rates went up. I mean, short term bonds sold off, but if you look at the ten year and especially the thirty year, those actually went down. So the thirty year was down yesterday and today, and the ten year was only up a little bit yesterday, and it was actually down a basis point today. So basically what that 
telling what the market or the bond market is saying is saying, hey, yes, the Fed is going to maybe be a little bit more hawkish near term. Maybe their terminal rate that they get to in this cycle is a bit higher than had been expected before, but they will soon pivot and go back to easing. And, you know, where the, the, the rates will be three, five years from now uh, isn't going to really matter. This this inflation data isn't really going to matter to that ultimate path of uh, of rates over the longer term. Um, so I think that was one of the reasons for optimism today, uh, a bit of reason why you had a little bit of a pushback or a, a rally, excuse me, uh, in the tech stocks uh, and a bit of weakness in the value just for today. Now let's grab a caller question right now. Hi, Steve and Justin. I was wondering, with a Roth IRA or a regular IRA, if you buy MLPs, do you still have to deal with K-1s? Or do K-1s not apply if it's in an IRA tax deferred account? Thanks so much for answering my question. This is a great call. I love this call because a lot of people, especially in this environment, they're chasing yield and they don't understand different types of stocks and the incomes that they pay can often be different. Uh, everyone thinks a dividend is a dividend. That, well, there isn't. There are qualified dividends and there are non-qualified dividends. Dividends Mainly what you're going to look at are REITs as well as MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships, or any type of limited partnership that is listed on an exchange. And so when they pay a dividend, it is not qualified, meaning it's not at that 15 or 20% like long-term capital gains rate, like, your, like the dividend you're going to get from a Procter & Gamble, a Johnson & Johnson, or an Apple, right? So the REITs and MLPs, they often pay pretty, pretty juicy dividends. Now, REITs are pretty straightforward. doesn't matter really what kind of uh, account you hold it in. There's no special K-1 there. But when it comes to a- MLPs, there are there are problems with holding them in a tax deferred account like an IRA or a 401k. And if you have MLP income over a thousand dollars annually, you will get a K1. So having a little bit and you know a few hundred bucks, no big deal. But once you start getting over that thousand dollars per year mark, that's when you get a K1, your accountant's gonna look at you funny. Uh, if you do it yourself, you're probably going to look at yourself in the mirror funny and not know exactly how to handle it. So uh, and remember that is also ordinary income to you. So it's income that's not taxed advantageously. Uh, and the money you are investing in a Roth or uh, an IRA or a 401k, that's supposed to be, right? So you're basically exempting that amount of income from that tax deferred nature of uh, an IRA, Roth IRA, 401k, et cetera. So, I definitely encourage you to stay away from having much exposure there. I, we would just say, just don't buy them at all. It makes your life a lot easier. You don't have to track whether it's a thousand dollars or not. If you want to buy them, buy them in a regular brokerage account. Yes, you're going to be taxed at the higher rate, but you should know that you should accept that. Okay. So hopefully you understand that now. If you want to be very diligent and keep it under a thousand and, and keep an eye on that, make sure that you know maybe that MLP doesn't raise their dividend, pay a special dividend. That happens sometimes too. They might spend a special dividend and push you over that thousand mark, and you didn't pay attention to that. So you have to be very diligent when you're owning these within a tax deferred account. Thanks for the call. Now we're heading into a break. Steve and I are happy to play your voice your recorded voice bank questions, but we love taking live calls as well. Our number never changes and it never closes. This is Invest Talk at 888 Chart. Why do listener questions make Invest Talk better? Which of these would you recommend? Because each caller presents fresh questions in their voice. I was curious if you still think aluminum has a ways to go from here. When do I know the right time to take profits? Should I be looking for an exit? Should I be holding here? And listeners instinctively realize that Invest Talk uniquely offers a welcome dose of investing satisfaction. I think you have a terrific show, and I've learned a whole lot. Hey guys, love your show. Uh, I've been listening for several years now, and I've 
Learned a lot. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley understand what investors need and want. I would look at it from a tax perspective. If there's no tax implications, move on, find better ways to use that money. I'm going with the odds. I think a half position now would at least get you in it and get you watching it so you won't lose track of it. Don't forget to call Investor. 888-99-CHART. One of the most rewarding things I do each weekday is host the Invest Talk podcast. I truly enjoy helping investors, and I know that every question counts and every answer I provide will be unbiased. You, the caller, get to chart the course for each Invest Talk podcast. Call with your questions anytime, day or night, 888 99Chart. Hi, Stephen Justin. This is James Kong from Brooklyn, New York. I have a question about Eastman Chemical Company, EMN. It dropped a lot on Tuesday. was wondering if this is a good entry. Um, looking forward to hearing your answer. Thank you so much for what you guys do. Have a great day. All right. Looking at Eastman Chemical. Eastman Chemical. Pretty large company, about a $10 billion market cap. And you're right. They did have a pretty big drop. I want to know why that is. Hmm. Was there a report? earnings report okay wells fargo downgraded them i do see that that was today though oh i see see they see they lowered their guidance for uh q3 uh so they certainly missed on uh are expected to miss for q3 earnings uh now how much is the big question let's see yeah so they're expecting adjusted earnings of two dollars per share in the q in third quarter, down from two dollars and forty six cents. That's about a twenty percent drop, over a twenty percent drop in expected earnings for the quarter, and the market did not like that. And and uh, so you know the bigger question is where is support? Where is a good value? Uh, certainly, physical products. We've talked about this. Physical products are demand is in, in decline. And Eastman Kodak Chemical is the Eastman Chemical, not Kodak. Eastman Chemical, uh, they make a lot of the products that go in, rather a lot of the pieces that go into the products. Uh, think of plastics, for example. And uh, it's certainly a good business, but it's it's cyclical. And where is that trough in earnings? Is the big question. Uh, now, let me get. This is one of those ones where you have to definitely pay attention to the chart. Uh, I would not be trying to catch a falling knife. That's kind of what this is at this point. Uh, and from a technical perspective, yeah, I don't see any major support till about $71. Now it's about 82. So I would be very patient on it. I like what you're looking at. The fact that long-term they have uh, consistent, uh, consistently strong return on equity, return on invested capital, return on equity is 21%. The long-term average is about 16%. So Good company, uh, but not a name that I'd be picking up right now. Thanks for the call. That was Eastman, Eastman Chemical, E-M-N. Now, my focus point concerns the story behind this headline. The NASDAQ closed higher as stock stabilized following their massive sell-off. And uh, this is one of those, uh, you know, yesterday was one of those days where there's a lot of clamoring, a lot of hoopla um, around the, the CPI number, and it did come up uh, in a little bit higher than expected. Uh, but then, you know, the market turns the page, and it focused today on this on the PPI number, the producer price index. And that is actually a little bit more indicative of what's happening real time. And because it doesn't have the rent component of CPI, and the rent component of CPI is often very lagging, meaning you know you signed a lease months ago, and that's still part of that basket, right? Whereas PPI, producer price index, these are baskets of goods that pe- that companies are producing right now, and so it's a little more indicative of what's happening in the economy, okay? Uh, today, now. It decelerated from 9.85 year over year to 8.72, kind of in line with what was expected. But 
you know, this was more reflective, reflective of what's happening in the economy. And I think that's why you didn't get a follow through from yesterday's move. Uh, and that's a, that's a lesson that you need to make, that you need to have is that uh, one day is just one day, especially when you don't break any major support or resistance, uh, which you didn't, right? We didn't break below last week's low. Uh, you need to really see follow through. You need to, uh, you know, make sure that that uh, data point that the market might have sold off on wasn't uh, something that is transitory, right? Uh, and that's kind of what what, what I'm seeing uh, here. Now, tomorrow we have the uh, consumer uh, spending, and that's going to be a big number. And then next week, you have the Fed the Fed uh, meeting, which now they're pricing a little odds of a 100 basis point increase, but still about a 70% chance it'll be 75% or 75 basis points. So what's most important is what the Fed says next week. Now we're heading into a break. My phone lines are waiting for you at 888 chart Invest Talk is here to help. And when you download the free Invest Talk podcasts, don't forget to rate and review. The phone lines are open 888 99Chart. Hey, Justin and Steve, this is Bob from Wisconsin. Thanks, guys, for all the work you do in educating and providing information to us listeners. Uh, I'm a regular listener and I really appreciate it. I'd like to know what you guys think of Lumen, L-U-M-N. I believe you'd mentioned that it's one of your client's holdings, but I see just yesterday or the day before they announced a change in the CEO. Apparently the CEO is stepping down to retire and they've announced a new replacement, Kate Johnson, who's a former Microsoft president. Does this change your opinion of this company and would you still consider it a buy? Thanks for your uh, help guys bye all right looking at lumen and you're correct they did change their ceo uh it was announced yesterday and frankly we think this is a a good thing like you said it's a former microsoft uh ceo uh to kate uh or not former microsoft executive and the new one will be kate johnson and uh, i think this is good because it pivots them more continuing to pivot them uh, to more of a business focused B2B type of company, which historically tend to be more profitable, less cyclical than your B2C type business. And they do have a lot of B2C business, but it's been, uh, they've sold off a lot of it. Uh, they're going to close on a sale uh, later this year. And then they are just kind of letting those uh, low margin or sometimes negative margin business kind of kind of roll off. And so uh, they're focused more on uh, the, the business uh, side of their business. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. You know, the, my, uh, Kate has worked for uh, Microsoft, I believe, for Disney. I'm trying to remember the other companies. She's, she's well, uh, well-versed uh, within the, the business community. So she knows kind of the backbone of, uh, you know, think of Microsoft's um, cloud and, and uh, how they... Uh, pivoted themselves more towards the business uh, servicing businesses as opposed to consumers. And that's done the business very well. And so I think uh, they could do the exact same thing. So I think overall, it's a, it's a good thing uh, for uh, her to step into this role and, you know, Lumen's cash flow generation, their uh, fiber assets are um, just incredible uh, compared to the, the valuation that the, the stock is trading at. Now they do have a lot of debt, um, but they're paying that down uh, and they have plenty of plenty of uh, of cash flow to, to service it. So um, unless she pivots uh, wrongly, uh, I think overall this will be a good a good change. Thanks for the call. Now let's pivot, let's talk a little bit about the bond market, the junk bond market. And ironically, there was a big shift when the Fed started to raise interest rates into what are called floating rate loans. And this is a perfect example of how investors look at the headline, look at the title of a fund, and they say, oh, floating rate. Rates go up. That's good for them. And like with most things in the investment world, there are 
multiple sides of the story, not just two sides, multiple sides that you have to consider. And what most did not consider was that most of these floating rate loans are junk rated, meaning that you're investing in so the reason they're floating raised because this is how they were able to raise capital. If you're investment grade, why would you want you, the, the amount of interest you're paying to fluctuate over time? Especially when rates have been low for a decade plus. You want to lock in those low rates if you can. Well, some companies cannot do that. And floating rate mutual funds and exchange traded funds took in $71 billion from January 2021 through April of this year. But since then, they've experienced $16, $16 billion in outflows. And why is that? Well, because the price of these loans continue to go down. They're now about $0.95 cents on the dollar, most of them. And now that's not the low of 85 cents. That was, it was during the depths of the financial crisis and COVID-19 lockdowns, et cetera. But you're certainly seeing many of these in decline. And why is that? It's because defaults are an, on the rise. Uh, $6 billion in August is the highest monthly total since October of 2020. And that's just a fraction of the $1.5 trillion market of floating rate loans. And borrowers are vulnerable to weaker economy as well as the rising cost of the debt. That's what I understand. These are junkier companies. They are uh, now at the whims of the interest rate market. And suddenly, if they're having to pay debt, that is now double, triple, quadruple, uh, and the interest rate higher than they have in the past, that puts them even more dire straits, okay? And so loan ratings are falling, and new loan sales have dropped from to $334 billion this year compared to $532 billion last year. And a lot of this is tied to private equity leveraged buyouts. And I think this is probably the biggest worry within the, the credit markets is what's going to happen with these floating rate loans. Uh, Ex traders continue to expect rates to go up and that's going to feed into a lot of a lot of these loans and the default rate is likely to rise to roughly 3.25 by middle next year from about one percent now so the credit quality here is the big worry and that's why if you have exposure here you want to be reducing that sooner rather than later give me a call at 888-99 chart if you don't know the numbers, you don't know your business. That's true when your business is growing fast and even more true when there's a lot of uncertainty. Inflation is running rampant, supply chains are clogged, and labor market is tight. What does that mean for margins? But not every business is in the dark. And NetSuite is helping business owners everywhere. Over 31,000 businesses know their numbers because they use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, planning, budgeting, and of course, inventory. So you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. In 2022, profit is the new growth. So NetSuite helps you identify rising costs, automate your manual business processes, and see where to save money. Know your numbers, know your business, and get to know how NetSuite can be the source of truth for your entire company. Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash investtalk right now. netsuite.com slash investtalk. netsuite.com slash investtalk. Your favorite band's about to play a sold-out show. You got in. Over here! With a friend, and found a spot close enough to see the set list. They're definitely playing your song. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. The stock market is volatile. It's constantly changing. So how are you positioned? Is your portfolio properly balanced? Or are you taking unnecessary risks? 
You can get guidance anytime for free if you go to investtalk.com and take the brief Riskalyze quiz. Now, on the next Invest Talk, the story behind this question Can ETFs harness momentum and add value to your portfolio? That story tomorrow, but for now, we're going to head over to New Hampshire. Talk to David about Newmont Mining. Hi, Justin. Uh, this is Dave from New Hampshire. Um, just calling to find out if not, now might be a good time to uh, step into Newmont and if I'm looking at a, a good buy price here. Well, Newmont is certainly down about 50% from its high, and a lot of that has to do with the higher input costs in the mining sector and a bit lower prices in gold, not dramatically so, but you know, pulled back from uh, 2000 all the way to the mid 1700s. And we kind of been shopping around since then. Now, caveat here is always, will gold go higher or will it kind of languish? And it's uh, it started to get some momentum before yesterday's yesterday's uh, sell-off uh, and had a little bit of fall through today, but we still remain kind of near longer term support. So I haven't broken anything to the downside. Uh, I do think we get a longer term durable bottom here in the second half of uh, this year, um, but that also may not come to fruition. Uh, a lot will depend on what happens with uh, the dollar and the Fed, et cetera. And so, uh, but Newmont is definitely one of the better gold mining companies out there. Uh, they're one of the largest, about a $34 billion market cap. And they do have uh, some other uh, production as well, but mainly gold. And that's why you know we like them. And they're well diversified in many different countries. You have the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Peru, Argentina, Australia, Ghana, etc. Uh, they have some silver, lead, zinc as well. And so, you know, it's once again, one of the better, if you're going to pick, step in and buy a gold miner, this is definitely one of the better uh, long-term operators in the space and uh, one of the safer names as well. So thanks for the call. Now let's pivot back to the Best Talk right. Voice Bank for a call that came in earlier at 888 chart I was calling about Unum Group, ticker symbol U-N-M. I own a small amount. Wanted to know if it's worth buying more or just selling. Just seeing what you guys think. Thanks. All right, looking at Unum Group. And this is a insurance company and they sell group and individual disability insurance as well as group life insurance, mainly here in the US as well as the UK. Now, revenues are increasing recently and a lot of this has to do with employment, right? Uh, as uh, an employment, employment dropped in 2020, 2021, suddenly the group insurance uh, started to uh, dwindle. And now as people get hired back on, their businesses pick back up. So it's earned six dollars and thirteen cents this year, which would be an all time high. But it's just a flatten out in earnings, uh, basically flat earnings uh, next year. Uh, but they're repurchasing about two hundred fifty million dollars in common stock. I like that. So they're 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 purchasing uh, stock with their cash flow, three point three percent dividend yield, and the stock chart is very strong. Relative strength at ninety seven. Definitely one of the stronger names in the group and. Remember, when interest go up, they can reinvest that, those uh, proceeds at a higher rate, and that typically is good for insurance companies. So uh, if you want to buy more, I'm going to give this one a thumbs up. That was Unum Group. U-N-M is the symbol. Now let's touch a little bit on having a mortgage in retirement. And I get this question all the time. And it was about hey, should I pay off my mortgage or should I invest the proceeds? And what we typically would always say is, well, when you're younger, and you're, you're able to take more risk. It's a risky endeavor to keep the debt, pay that interest, and then go invest the money because obviously the investments are not guaranteed. But when you're young, you can afford to do that. You have consistency of income, you have the ability to work, and pay off that mortgage, et cetera. But once you hit retirement, that becomes a different calculus. You wanna be more conservative in your thinking. You aren't gonna be working. So cash flow is important. So typically paying off that mortgage by the time you retire is the right way to go. 
But as interest rates rise and a, the vast majority of people have locked in 3% mortgage around that rate, and now you can get, you know, we're getting seven plus percent on quality corporate bonds. Does it make sense to pay that off when you can go reinvest that relatively safely with a much better yield? We're seeing this a lot in the mortgage market as well, or the rental market. A lot of people, especially here in California, low cap rate state, meaning the yields on rentals are very low. Well, there's headaches with rentals. You can go reinvest that. You sell the property, reinvest it at six, seven, eight percent and not have any headaches and earn a better income. So same kind of thinking here with higher interest rates. And when interest rates were low, you can you didn't have that option, right? Your option was to invest it in treasuries at 3%, 2%. And corporates weren't paying much more than that. Now that's that's definitely changed. And so the calculus is a bit different. Now, that doesn't mean that you automatically don't pay off the mortgage, but you have to think about those trade-offs. And the trade-offs are changing. Not only that, but let's say you need the money for emergencies, right? You can't go and take that money out of, you know, you can't, can't take that mortgage out again at 3%. Unlikely to be the case anytime soon. A 3% mortgage. Maybe ever. You might never see that in your lifetime. So that opportunity cost calculation is a bit different. And then you have to think of your taxes. Now before, the more the interest was typically for a lot of people tax deductible. But with the 2017 tax cuts and the higher standard deduction, that's less important. Okay. And so there's not that tax adjusted nature of 3% minus your tax rate, you know, bringing that down to the low twos. And so when you're thinking about these things, it's uh, it's important to always assess the market environment and the risk versus reward. And when things change so dramatically, like the underlying cost of capital. That's what interest rates are. The cost of capital. You have to adjust your calculations as well. Just like the market is adjusting their calculations on growth stocks. Okay. So it doesn't mean you don't pay off your mortgage, but it's the argument is a little more there to keep the mortgage, reinvest that you know, moderately, uh, conservatively, and earn a higher rate. Now let's grab another listener question from the Invest Talk listener line at 888 chart Hello, would love to get your opinion on AutoZone. The ticker symbol is A-Z-O. I would like to get your opinion on the valuation and how future growth of electric vehicles will affect the stock. Thank you. All right, this is AutoZone, and they're one of the premier sellers of aftermarket automotive parts, and they did very well during COVID. Why? Because buying a new car was expensive. So it was cheaper to just fix your own car. And their business boom, they made $60 per share in 2019. 2021, they made $92 per share, so let's make a dollar or $115 per share this year, and then $126 next year. I think this is drastically off. I don't think they're going to come anywhere close to this. Why? Look at used car prices. Used car prices fell in August by the largest amount ever. The market's coming back. There's defaults. The, 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 the auto loan market is pulling back. There's a lot more defaults uh, from the lower end borrowers, which means that not anyone can just go buy a car anymore. And so there's a lot more cars in the lot and it's, it's easier to, um, replace the car if things are broken. 
And so I don't see this. I see, I see earnings mean reverting. Let me put it simply. And long-term when it comes to EVs, yeah, I think that will certainly be a headwind. EVs are the left, less moving parts. You know, they still need tires and you still need shocks and, and, and all the other things that go along with a car. But most of the things that you're buying are at, at AutoZone are related to the engine and the drivetrain. And so I, I see that as a long-term issue as well. So I'm absolutely passing on AutoZone. I think it's over-earning. It's going to mean revert. And I do see some long-term headwinds. Now, I don't think that they're probably as major from the EV space as a lot of people want to make it out to be because I think the EV space will grow a lot slower than everyone's expecting due to just price constraints. You know, a lot of people don't have $60,000, $70,000 to go buy an electric car. And so... To me, the negative here is more along the lines of it's just going to mean revert. Now, we're all, almost at summer's end. Fall is coming here quickly. We have a week left in summer. And volatility is here. September is often a time for volatility. And the question is, is your portfolio prepared for this volatility? Are you prepared as an investor to make the right decisions based on your goals, based on the market environment? Well, if you need help figuring that out, I encourage you to reach out to myself or Steve Peasley at our company, KP Financial, where we operate with the same philosophy, which is independent thinking and shared success. We provide unbiased guidance, both on and off air, and we practice parallel investing, which means we invest right alongside our clients. So I encourage you to take advantage of our free portfolio review assessment via telephone, Skype, or go to meeting, or send us a message through investtalk.com or call 800, excuse me, 800. 800- 557-5461. That is our direct number to our office in Irvine, California. We just need a few minutes and we can help you optimize your portfolio's performance for your needs. The sooner you reach out, the sooner we can help. Now, next up, another listener question. So hang on. Why do listener questions make Invest Talk better? Which of these would you recommend? Because each caller presents fresh questions in their voice. When do I know the right time to take profits? And listeners instinctively realize that Invest Talk uniquely offers a welcome dose of investing satisfaction. I think you have a terrific show, and I've learned a whole lot. So don't forget to call Invest Talk, 888 99 Chart. Hi, Stephen Justin. I'm calling about Codel Corporation, Q-D-E-L. I currently hold some shares and was wondering if it would be a good time to add more. It seems like it's going on a downtrend. So I want to get your opinion listening to the podcast for the answer. Thank you. All right, looking at QDEL, and this is a company that is engaged in development, manufacturing, and marketing of rapid diagnostic testing solutions. Think of COVID at home products. Earnings were $3 before the pandemic, and they went all the way up to $20 per share in 2020, 17, almost $18 per share last year, expect to be $12 per share this year, $5.58 next year. No, this is an absolute dead sell. It's in downtrend. Look, COVID is behind us, okay? It is, it has mutated to become less infectious. Uh, people are less worried about it. And, you know, the data comes clearer and clearer that you just live with it, right? You older individuals probably should get vaccinated, risk versus reward is good, younger people, not so much. Uh, and they're pulling a lot of requirements, continuously pulling a lot of requirements from the CDC to just private uh, companies are pulling requirements for being vaccinated, being tested, etc. So you don't want to be tied to companies that made a bunch of money off of the COVID freakout. You don't. Because Less and less people are freaking out about it. Less and less governments are freaking out about it. Less and less corporations are freaking out about it. 
So you need to be selling this as quickly as possible. Okay. Remember, you have to invest through the windshield. That's one of the, the biggest mistakes the average investor makes is they look at, they, they, they have Yahoo Finance. They have some very basic information on what's happening, what, what has happened with the company. And they start to extrapolate that out. And you have to assess, will this business trend be sustainable or will it fizzle out? Is this a short-term phenomenon or is this a long-term durable business? It's rarely a long-term durable business in times like these. The ones that are cheap, they look cheap, right? This looks cheap because, you know, last year I made $18 per share. It looks cheap in the $83 stock. It's not. It's extremely expensive. So you need to sell it sooner rather than later. Now, Stephen, I think are thankful for your podcast support and our free downloads will always continue but I want to make you aware of two other ways you can find our material and unbiased guidance Best Talk has a YouTube channel as well as an Instagram following as well we're building out more content on those platforms so head over there and subscribe now we're heading into our final break I'm ready to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom at 888 chart This is Invest Talk. Is your portfolio balanced? Is it optimized? Is it delivering the types of gains you want and need to achieve financial freedom? Well, turn up the volume because there are many questions that deserve unbiased answers. And Justin Klein is here now, ready to take your calls live. 888-99-CHART. Hi, Stephen Justin. My name is Todd in Colorado, six-month listener here. Love the show. Uh, I have a question about where to store holdings for stock buying and investing. I have an IRA, but it's maxed for the year. Is it wise or even legal to have several IRA accounts? Or what is the best way to set up accounts to invest from? Uh, anyway, appreciate everything you guys do. Love the show. And I look forward to hearing the answer. Have a good one. It is absolutely legal to have multiple IRA accounts, 401k accounts, etc. You can have as many as you want. What is prohibited is how much you can contribute in total each year. Okay, so don't think you can go and put $6,000 in one and then open another another broker and put another $6,000. Uh-uh, not how it works, okay? It's a max for you individually uh, each year. You can split that up. You can have a account over at Fidelity, another at E-Trade, and another at Schwab, and another at TD Ameritrade. It doesn't really matter. It's all about the contributions that you make. And if you've maxed out your IRA, well, then just I would put it into a regular brokerage account and continue to save there, hopefully getting your full company match if you have a 401k it's as well. So, yeah, no limit on IRA accounts. Now, we're almost out of time, but we can squeeze in one more caller question that came in earlier at 888-99-CHART. Hello. I have saved up around $80,000, and I'm 21 years old, and I was wondering what I should do to invest my money and what I should do to make it grow. I was considering buying or putting money down on a house or a townhouse or a condo in my area. But Los Angeles seems very expensive. I was wondering if maybe there's another state or another city where I could possibly invest in property or whether or not this is the right time to invest in property. Thank you. Hope to hear it on the next podcast. All right. So right now is not a good time to invest in property. For the most part, uh, every almost every part of the country is overpriced. Uh, and prices are going to come down with mortgage rates at 6%. Just the long and short of it. When you go from three to six in less than a year, it just throws a monkey wrench in everything. On top of that, there's a lot of people that have locked in that three percent rate, and there's not they don't have a lot of reason to sell because they have low carrying costs of that house. So there's going to be it's going to be a slow process for this uh, this correction in prices. 
Um, so I'd be very patient. And then here in California in general, cap rates are extremely low, much, much lower than you're going to get in the investment world. And so, you know, it's, it's just not a great place. California is not a great rental market. Too. It's, uh, it's more about cash flow when you're uh, trying to buy a rental. So I would put all real estate buying off for at least 18 months, probably closer to 36 months. Okay. That's number one. Now you have $80,000, uh, which means you have some cash to put to work. Uh, if you are looking to buy a home for yourself, a, that's a different endeavor, right? An investment property versus your own personal home, very different thought process there. If you want to buy your own personal home, still be patient, but try to find the right opportunities, something you can afford, something you know f- comfortable with the monthly payments in your job and your income, et cetera. If you, have, if you want to set money aside for that, keep it very safe, secure, uh, think of a high yield savings account, FDIC insured, et cetera. You're not going to get more than, you know, two and a half percent or so right now, uh, but it's something. Okay. Now, if you aren't going to buy a home anytime soon, then you want to start thinking about where to put that money to work, uh, probably in the market, stock market, you're young. And the first thing is making sure you have your, your full company match, whatever your if you have a 401k, your company's matching that max max that out, uh, at least the company match, maybe even more. Okay. And then an IRA, an IRA is a great place to be. You're relatively young Roth IRA. It's probably uh, what you want to contribute to max that out each year as well. Um, and then beyond that, then you can just open up a regular brokerage account. So that's the thought process that you have to go through and start and be patient. Don't, you don't need to rush into it. Make sure you understand all the risks. Maybe make sure you understand all the tax ramifications and be diligent at learning and becoming educated and listening to the show. Obviously, that will help as well. Thanks for the call. I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads and our official Invest Talk download count crossed over 45 million last week. Thanks to you. Get your Invest Talk podcast anytime at iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and be sure to rate and review on iTunes. And if you leave a brief question with your rating, we will prioritize your answer. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. InvestTalk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461. Steve Peasley is president and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial. Thank you for listening and your comments and questions are welcome on our 24-hour listener line at 888-99-CHART.